Um, so welcome to the COVID-19 internal medicine refresher. Um, today we have Dr. Nazia Sharkladin. Um, she is a PGY4 internal medicine uh, physician at uh, University of Alberta. Um, she did her core internal medicine training at the University of Calgary and passed her Royal College examination in internal medicine last year. Um, just before we get started, um, I am just going to give a quick shout out to the organizers um, from the Muslim Medical Association of Canada. So we have Dr. Arfin Malik, PGY5 Psychiatry at University of Toronto, Dr. Tanzila Basreen, family doctor in North York and ER physician in Lindsay, Ontario, um, Dr. Ahmed Faris, PGY3 Public Health and Preventative Medicine at University of Montreal, uh, Dr. Hamza Qureshi, PGY4 Internal Medicine at U of T. He just gave our first uh, session. Um, Dr. Nazia Sharfuddin, uh, PGY4 Internal Medicine at U of A, and Dr. Sayara Schwetz, PGY4 Emer Emergency Medicine at University of Saskatchewan. And I'm uh, Bilal Lone. I do sports and exercise medicine here in Hamilton. Um, so I'll hand over the mic to uh, Nazia, and then we can get started. Let me just make you host, Nazia. Thank you for that introduction, Bilal. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us on this sunny Sunday in March. The focus of this webinar will be to touch on high yield internal medicine cases that you may encounter on the wards, the emergency department, or overnight on call. Oh, uh, can everyone hear me? I'm just going to check with Bilal on WhatsApp to see if it's a yes. Okay, I'm going to keep going, um, hoping that everybody can hear me. Our talk today is designed for anyone who will be redeployed to internal medicine during the coronavirus pandemic. We welcome you to take notes and ask questions by the chat option. The slides will be available afterwards. We, um, the MMAC and myself have uh, no conflicts of interest to declare. I, we would like to note that the information surrounding COVID-19 is developing rapidly and the information contained in these slides is current as of March 22nd, 2020. Due to our time limitation today, the seminar will focus on high yield clinical pearls instead of diving deep into the nitty gritty of pathophysiology. This is also not meant to be a comprehensive study of each topic but rather the key pearls that will help you on the front lines in acute care. Today's refresher will focus on the A, B, C, D, E's of common internal medicine topics, acute respiratory failure, basics of critical care, COVID-19 primer, delirium, electrolyte management, and we'll end off with the Q&A. You may have noticed that some topics such as chest pain, withdrawal, addictions may be missing, and that is because our lovely colleagues in emergency medicine, medicine and psychiatry are currently working on a similar webinar and will be covering those topics. Before we begin, I would like to draw your attention to a high level approach to internal medicine itself. Internists are known for our long list of differentials and this is where I'll let you into our little secret. Almost every single presentation can be broken down into the four letters, M, A, I, D. M for malignancy or metabolic causes, A for autoimmune, I for infection, inflammation, ischemia, iatrogenic, and D for drugs, intoxication, withdrawal, or non-adherence. Our first topic is acute respiratory failure. And I know it's a busy slide, so I'd like to ask you to actually not look at the slide and focus, and if you are looking, just look at the first row of that table. Acute, acute respiratory failure can be divided into hypoxemia and hypercarbia. Hypoxemia is defined as a partial pressure of oxygen less than 60 millimeters mercury on ABG and oxygen saturation that is less than 90% on room air or requiring supplemental oxygen to maintain that threshold. Hypercarbia is defined by a PaCO2 more than 40 millimeters mercury and associated typically with respiratory acidosis as denoted by a pH less than 7.35. The normal values of PaCO2 on ABG is 35 to 40, and normal value of pH on an ABG is 7.35 to 7.4. Now, 
I ask you to cover up that differential diagnosis that we have because it's a long list. These slides are meant to be uh, a reference point for you if you need them in a glitch, but during the talk, I'll try to break them down into uh, cognitive heuristics and memory aids so that you can pull them up uh, when you need them on call or on the wards. For hypoxemia, the differential is really twofold, cardiac and respiratory causes. For cardiac causes, acute heart failure is the most common, manifested as pulmonary edema or bilateral pleural effusion. That can happen in cases in patients who have chronic congestive heart failure or an acute coronary incident like an MI or ACS that has led to further complications of heart failure. For respiratory causes of hypoxemia, um, it is related to pulmonary embolus, pneumothorax, pleural effusion, and in severe cases, ARDS. Moving on to hypercarbia, this can also be divided into three broad categories, respiratory categories, medication related, and neurologic. Under respiratory, airway obstruction is typically the most common, COPD and asthma exacerbations, as well as PE. Medications, uh, medications are that can lead to hypercarbia are opioids, such as sedative agents, and neurologic causes are, can be related to a brainstem stroke, ALS, or myasthenia gravis. Uh, now, my, the approach to acute hypoxemia will be a bedside approach today. This is not going to be your typical talk that asks you to calculate AA gradient, and we're not going to spend any time talking about shunts. Instead, I'd like you to ask you to imagine with me, it is three in the morning, you may have had about 30 minutes of uh, sleep on your overnight call shift, and you're woken up by a page. You're asked to see a patient on the wards who's acutely deteriorating. Their oxygen requirements are going up and they're, have, they're struggling to breathe. When you arrive at the bedside, what will you do? You will do exactly what you've always done, which is beginning with the ABCs, airway, breathing, circulation, then moving on to the vital signs and a focused, and a focused physical exam, I'm focusing here on respiration. I've broken down our approach to acute hypoxemia by things you may hear on your chest auscultation or respiratory exam examination, or what you may not hear. Most commonly, you will hear either wheezes, crackles, or appreciate focal findings such as dullness to consolidation and bronchial breath sounds. Or the fourth option, the lungs might sound completely clear. So we'll start there. What if you're called to the bedside and it's a 70 year old man who was just admitted to the hospital a few days ago with a new diagnosis of cancer. And it is three in the morning now and he is acutely deteriorated. He is struggling to talk, he's struggling to breathe and his oxygen requirements are climbing. When you put your stethoscope on his chest, his lungs sound fine. It sounds completely normal. You can hear the breath sounds. So what is the problem? Um, this is where I'd like you to think of PE. Pulmonary embolus will have a normal respiratory uh, lung auscultation exam, but can be critical and life-threatening if not identified quickly. Uh, an acute aspiration event can also lead to an acute deterioration without giving time for the lungs to have the signs of consolidation or, or other pathology that you may hear on exam. This will help narrow your differential and allow you to uh, send for the right investigations. If you're hearing wheezes on exam, the top differentials are airway obstruction, either COPD or asthma. Do keep in mind though that cardiac, there is a thing called cardiac wheeze where in an acute cardiac setting, um, you may hear wheezes, but it's truly pulmonary edema manifesting as wheezes. Wheezes can also be heard in cases of anaphylaxis, but hopefully you will have other clues to guide you if that was truly the case, such as uh, allergy history, skin changes, circulatory collapse, or GI symptoms as well. Crackles are due to lungs fully being filled up by fluid, be it blood or water or edema. Pulmonary edema from a cardiac cause or acute heart failure is one of the most common causes of hearing crackles on your lung exam and most common etiology of acute hypoxemia. However, ARDS can also present similarly 
and it'll be important to keep that in your pocketbook of differentials. Bilateral pleural effusions can also lead to crackles, and you may also hear unilateral uh, crackles that signify unilateral pleural effusion. And lastly, focal findings, these are your pneumonia, pneumothorax, and other, other findings. We'll now speak about the most common causes of acute hypoxemia that you may encounter in internal medicine, starting with acute heart failure. The symptoms that will be the most common and obvious to you are dyspnea on exertion, orthopnea, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, and bilateral leg swelling. Some clues on physical exam are hypoxemia, an elevated JVP, crackles on chest auscultation, and bilateral pitting edema. On investigations, BNP is typically elevated, or if your center has it, pro-NT BNP. Chest x-ray can also show bilateral patchy opacities, curly B lines, cardiomegaly, bat and a bat wing appearance. I have an example on the slide here. The black part is the aeration in the lungs and the white denotes the edema that's taken over. So in a very severe case such as this, you may see a whiteout or a washout of the lungs. So how do we manage it? First, we'll need to confirm diagnosis. And here, um, it's similar to what we saw in the previous slide. You would send BNP and chest x-ray. And then, like in anything in internal medicine, we need to determine why. Why did this patient go into acute heart failure now? If a patient has history of CHF, it doesn't mean that they can go into a, a heart failure exacerbation at any time. There is usually an insult or a cause that has pushed them over the edge. And here you can use the mnemonic I introduced earlier, which is M-A-I-D, or you can use the four eyes that we have here as well. Either will help. Uh, and the most common causes of acute heart failure exacerbation are an ischemic event, so an ACS or a coronary event that could have happened or an arrhythmogenic event, any infection, whether viral, bacterial, or otherwise, an increased dietary salt load, so many patients, when they're admitted to the hospital, if they have a history of CHF, sometimes it is missed on their diet orders on admission that they should be on a sodium-restricted diet. So it is possible that during hospitalization, they have just consumed more salt than they usually would at home, and this has now pushed them over on the Frank Sterling curve. Or there's just not enough medications. They have either run out at home, they're non-compliant, or maybe their home meds were not uh, were not ordered when they were admitted to the hospital. Determining the precipitant is key because your management will address that. And if you don't address the precipitant, then the heart failure will not be adequately managed as it can continue on despite your acute treatment. For treatment, there is three, there's a threefold approach to treatment. Firstly, the acute management and stabilizing of the patient. Secondly, determining the precipitant. And thirdly, monitoring. For acute stabilizing and treatment, uh, we, are, we treat patients with IV Lasix. Uh, and if their blood pressure allows, then a nitro patch. Uh, a good dose of IV Lasix at the beginning is 40 milligrams. And a decent dose of nitro patch is 0.4 milligrams. Now, Lasix lasts for six hours, so you, you may need to repeat it again, depending on the patient's volume status. So, so closed volume status monitoring is absolutely key. The second part of management is treating the underlying precipitant. So if this is an infection-related exacerbation, then treating that infection. Most commonly, uh, an, overlying, an underlying pneumonia can tip elderly patients into acute heart failure. So we recommend giving empiric antibiotics and using your clinical gestalt. Lastly, for monitoring of, your, uh, of the heart failure and your treatment includes watching their morning weights. Morning weights are a marker of diuresis and how much fluid they're losing. The target is usually one to two kilograms a day. Um, if possible, we also recommend that you check their urine output but we understand that may not be practical. And lastly, 
don't forget to put them on a sodium restricted diet of less than two grams a day and also fluid restrict them less than 1.5 liters a day. Our next common offender of acute hypoxemic rest failure and acute hypercapnic respiratory failure is COPD and asthma exacerbation. Some clinical clues are dyspnea, cough that may be productive or not, wheezes on chest auscultation, and signs of respiratory distress. So sitting up in a tripod position, struggling to speak, accessory muscle usage, and even appearing agitated. On their chest x-ray, they may be signs of hyperinflation or it could be completely clear, or they may be superimposed with signs of infection, such as consolidation. Some subtle clues that may not be evident unless you ask for it is they may say that they've been using their puckers more at home. They're having trouble exercising or keeping up with their daily activities of living. They're just not coping overall. So the, sometimes patients can the consult that you may receive is a failure to thrive, but it's really a COPD exacerbation because they've just not been coping. Management for, for COPD and asthma exacerbations are very similar. First, and if you notice, there will be a theme emerging. For almost all of these acute cases, the treatment plan is threefold. First, stabilize and treat the acute insult. Secondly, find the precipitant or the underlying cause and treat that. And thirdly, monitoring. So first, for acute stabilizing and treatment, uh, we have to make sure their oxygenation is, is adequate. So give supplemental oxygenation, uh, oxygen if they need it and maintain their stats at 90% minimum. You don't have to go over aggressive and give them and try to get them at 97 or 100. If anything, that could be harmful. So just maintaining at 90% or higher is enough. Um, do keep in mind that many COPD patients are carbon dioxide retainers. So for those patients, their SATs are low, their SAT targets are lower, 88 to 92 percent. Part of the acute stabilization and treatment is starting with bronchodilators, ventolin, and ipratropium and atrovent. Now I know the so we put the guidelines as per uh, the COPD guidelines, but with the coronavirus pandemic, there's a huge concern about nebulizing procedure. So we don't recommend that you use NEBS unless otherwise stated and you have a hospital policy and personal protection in place um, to do that because there is a risk of aerosolizing the virus. So for uh, keeping COVID-19 in mind, try, we do recommend that you try to uh, limit any aerosolizing procedures or treatments as possible. Corticosteroids are also part of the acute management, either prednisone 40 orally or methylprednisolone by IV. Second part of our management will be treating the underlying precipitant. And most commonly, it is infection. Um, COPD exacerbations are typically accompanied by a community-acquired pneumonia or a viral uh, infection of sorts. And for COPD exacerbation, giving empiric antibiotics is part of the guidelines. And we typically recommend either ceftriaxone and azithromycin as a combo or amoxicillin and clavulin as well. Our third part of management, like with all acute cases, is monitoring uh, our effects and monitoring for, uh, for, progress, for clinical progress. Is the patient improving? Are they able to sit up, uh, sit back, relax, speak in clear sentences? Is their oxygen requirements going down? and they're subjectively feeling better, or are they feeling worse? They're able to now speak only in syllables versus words. Their GCS is dropping and they're fatiguing out. A sign of fatigue would be their chest exam starts to sound clear. That's a sinister sign and a big red flag that we gotta call ICU right away and have a respiratory therapist and more support at the bedside. Traditionally, you can consider BiPAP for severe COPD exacerbations that are not responding to pharmacotherapy. However, with the recent coronavirus uh, risks happening, uh, again, I would ask you to caution if using BiPAP. Uh, my apologies, I see some questions coming. So I'm gonna take a second to just look at that to see if, we, if there's any questions that need to be answered right now. 
Um, there's a question about steroids. Uh, well, are you able to clarify it? Slides will be available for download after the seminar, and this session will also be recorded. Can systemic steroids be used? Yes. So this, the prednisone and methylprednisolone are systemic steroids, and they are part of the treatment for COPD exacerbation and asthma exacerbation. Uh, and the IV and PO choices are really dependent on what the patient can tolerate. If you feel like their GCS is dropping and they may be uh, a risk for swallowing, then you can try the IV route. If they're alert, awake, and uh, able to cooperate, then oral uh, modality is just fine. Uh, I see another uh, chat. Sorry, Nizia, there was also, yeah. there was also a question from the, uh, the heart failure slide. Oh, um, somebody was asking, what about uh, beta blockers? Can you use them once they're euvolemic? Oh, sorry, I missed that question. Yes, absolutely. Um, uh, once they're euvolemic, please go ahead and restart their beta blockers. Um, I hope that answers your question. Um, okay, so I'm going to move on to the next acute case, if that's okay. Oops. Okay, so we'll touch quickly on pulmonary embolus. Uh, the clinical clues for pulmonary embolus are dyspnea, hemoptysis, tachycardia, history of uh, his, or signs or symptoms of DVT, recent immobilization such as a surgery or a travel. Travel can be defined as any road trip or car travel over four hours or any plane trip that's over four hours as well, um, as well as any history of malignancy, whether active or prior. The Wells criteria, which is uh, which is shown on this slide, has similar clinical clues as well. And it's a great score to, to determine what your pretest probability of PE is. The higher the score, the higher the probability. Diagnosis is done through CT pulmonary angiogram, which is the gold standard. But if your site does not have it or there's any contraindications to that, you may consider a VQ scan. Treatment uh, is with anticoagulation. Typically, any low molecular weight heparin, such as tinzaparin or enoxaparin, is a good first agent. It's safe. It only lasts for 12 to 24 hours, depending, and uh, it is um, safe in most cases, such as renal failure, hepatic failure, and so forth. DOACs can also be trialed as a first agent if the patient has no contraindications to them, such as uh, cancer. IV heparin was traditionally used as the first line, but now people are moving away from that because it's cumbersome. If you give someone IV heparin, you have to check their APTT every six hours, adjust the dose. Um, but the benefit of IV heparin is if there is any need for invasive procedures or if the patient was going for surgery, this would be a good option because you can turn it off uh, as needed and um, decrease risk of bleeding if there is a procedure that needs to happen. Uh, there's only one indication for thrombolytics, and that is hemodynamic instability. If you're moving towards thrombolytics, then this is definitely a time where I would ask you to get your staff or senior involved so um, they can help guide you with the doses and ensure what the and ensure if it's appropriate or not. I don't think I've seen I've seen thrombolytics used sparingly in my four years of internal medicine, and it's certainly not a common find, uh, a common case. Uh, moving on to infection. So a pretty bad infection can cause uh, hypoxemia, and COVID-19 can certainly present as a viral pneumonia uh, or have any superimposed bacterial pneumonia. So infection can be divided into bacterial and viral. Most common cause of bacterial infection is community-acquired pneumonia. In some cases, uh, for patients who may have had recent exposure to the healthcare system, they could have HCAP or healthcare-associated pneumonia. Patients who may be at risk for HCAP are those who are living in a long-term care facility or nursing home, anyone hospitalized in the last 90 days, uh, anyone who has been to a dialysis clinic or been to a hospital in the last 30 days, anyone on active chemo, IV treatments, or wound care in the last 30 days, and the symptoms are similar for both. Typically, a productive cough, fevers, chills, and signs of focal consolidation on chest x-ray, as well as leukocytosis on lab work. 
Oh, I see a chat thing blinking. I'm just gonna uh, see if there's a question. Um, Oh, okay. That was so. The question is about COVID nineteen from pneumonia. That's a great question. So COVID nineteen is a virus that can lead to uh, pneumonia, just like any other virus can. So influenza A can also lead to a viral pneumonia or predispose you to superimposed bacterial pneumonia. So the treatment is really going to be the same as um, as before. We will cover COVID nineteen in detail coming up. So I will address the COVID nineteen specific uh, medications then, but just kind of keep in mind that any infection that you see could have a COVID-19 uh, concurrence to it. Um, I see my chat's flashing, sorry. Okay. Um, sorry, Bilal, did you say I have a question? Um, okay. Well, I'll, I'll let, feel free to interrupt me if, um, if I'm not addressing it. I'm sorry. Oops. Um, the treatment for common community acquired pneumonia is typically ceftriaxone and azithromycin. Ceftriaxone covers the most common bugs that lead to CAP, which are strep pneumo, Moraxilla cateralis, and H flu. Azithromycin covers the atypicals. For H CAP, it's really important to know what is prevalent in your local facilities. But some general bugs to consider are MRSA, Pseudomonas, and other multidrug resistance that could be prevalent in your community. Um, almost every hospital and region has a list of the prevalent uh, pathogens and multidrug pathogens available and what they recommend. So I, I ask you to take a look at that. In Alberta, in Calgary, PIP, Tezo, and Banco are first choices if uh, we're thinking of Pseudomonas and MRSA for a patient with HCAP, uh, similarly in Edmonton as well. For a viral pneumonia or infection, um, they typically present with nonspecific symptoms such as a non-productive cough, fevers, chills, myalgias, arthralgias. They may have had a sick contact. Your chest x-ray could be completely clear. Uh, in the era of COVID-19, we have to ask about travel history and any exposure history. Are they a healthcare worker? And their WBCs typically show an increase or a decrease of lymphocytes. Uh, treatment for viral pneumonia is supportive. Tamiflu or Oseltamivir is recommended by IDSA if you um, can establish symptom onset in the last two days or if the patient is very elderly and, and have atypical symptoms. I'm going to take a pause to see the question. Oh, the question was about the PE. Is the well score relevant for inpatients or more useful to assess patients at the time of presentation to ED? That's a great question. I use the well score all the time in any scenario, so I think you can use it anytime. Um, I wonder if your question about the inpatient is uh, alluding to the fact that they may already be on DVT prophylaxis and that's a great that's a great question. I have seen a patient where they were on DVT prophylaxis awaiting surgery and they've they developed a massive PE. So again, using your clinical gestalt, um, better be safe than sorry if they have a moderate to high score on the on the Wells criteria. Even if they're on DVT prophylaxis or anticoagulation, I would still do investigations to rule out PE. Thanks for asking that. That's a great question. So moving on to the next acute case under respiratory failure. Um, oh, sorry. No, we're moving on to the BiPAP indications. Um, in the era of COVID, I implore you to use caution um, in using BiPAP. But just for, for knowledge's sake, um, the indications for BiPAP are twofold. Acute hypoxemic respiratory failure and acute hypercarbic respiratory failure from COPD exacerbations. Um, with further criteria being pH less than 7.3 and pacO 2 more than 45. There is a small, I, I know it says pneumonia and, and immunocompromised, but there is very limited evidence for that. And I have never used it myself uh, for a patient uh, in that scenario. So I would ask you to use caution in the era of COVID-19, a patient who's immunocompromised and having pneumonia are extremely high risk for COVID, so I would certainly not use it for them. Uh, if you find that you're going into 
that nothing is working and uh, you're heading in that direction, it would be a time to call ICU and escalate support as well. Contraindications for BiPAP look like a really long list. So I've broken them down into three categories that may be helpful um, to group them in your head. Uh, airway or the general region of the head and face, B for blood pressure or bleeding, and C for cardiac instability. So for the airway piece, any upper airway obstruction or inability to protect airways, whether by uh, being high risk for aspiration or inability to clear secretions uh, is a contraindication for BiPAP. If you think about it, if they have the BiPAP machine on their face and um, they start to bring up secretions, they could aspirate and there could be even further complications and uh, danger as a result. So that's why it's a contraindication. Severe encephalopathy, as defined by a GCS less than 10, is also a contraindication because of risk of aspiration and further danger. Uh, any facial trauma, neurologic surgery, or deformity of the head and face is also a contraindication. Hemodynamic instability is a contraindication because BiPAP can lead to a, a transient drop in your blood pressure. So if you're already hypotense, this can lead to a significant circulatory collapse. Um, for cardiac, any unstable arrhythmia, cardiac arrest or respiratory arrest are also contraindicated. Who are the people who will benefit from BiPAP? Those who are a younger age, have lower acuity of illness, they're able to cooperate and have a higher GCS score, they're alert and awake, or they have good uh, BiPAP adherence of the face, so less air leaking, uh, are, are patients who may be successful uh, if using BiPAP. Also patients with a moderate acidemia, so a pH between 7.1 to 7.35, and those who improve quickly after BiPAP is initiated have a higher risk of success, uh, have a higher chance of success. I'm going to take a pause to uh, answer any questions. So I see the chat uh, sign is blinking at me again. Are there any lower airway relative contraindications to BiPAP? Um, I'm not sure I understand that question. So the previous slide, which I'll go back to. Uh, so this is a pretty good list. Um, I guess what I would say, what I would caution is, I would not use it in patients who don't have the COPD exacerbations or acute heart failure indications. Um, there is very limited evidence for lower respiratory tract infections such as pneumonia, um, and I, I would be very hesitant to use it in those patients. Um, the evidence is just not strong enough. So moving on to the final case of acute hypoxemic respiratory failure, and this will be our segue into critical care, we'll touch on ARDS. ARDS used to scare the living lights out of me when I was a junior resident. Um, it's a very intimidating a, a clinical condition and it's appropriately managed only in ICU. The way I, I thought about ARDS is when we get a cut on our skin, on, on our leg, for example, there's a scar that comes up. Our neutrophils, the body sends white blood cells to that area to help support and heal. Something similar happens in the lungs when, with ARDS. There is essentially an insult or a precipitant that happens that leads to that cut, if you will. Um, the body tries to help by sending neutrophils and white blood cells to the lungs to try to heal that area. However, the lungs are not meant to hold those molecules. The lung is there just to ga do gas exchange. And by taking up valuable space for a gas exchange, it leads to significant edema and capillary leakage. And that's where ARDS comes from. ARDS stands for Acute Respiratory Distress Center, uh, Syndrome, and it's an acute inflammatory reaction that affects the lungs and leads to severe hypoxemic respiratory failure. The diagnostic criteria is from the Berlin definition. It must be acute, so within one week of the insult, which we'll go into it later there must be bilateral airspace opacities, and there's a picture coming in the next slide. There should be no evidence of cardiogenic pulmonary edema, which means uh, no signs of um, cardiac cause 
for the pulmonary edema, such as heart failure, MI, ACS, arrhythmia, and so forth. And there will be a moderate to severe hypoxemia as evidenced by the PF ratio. PF, um, the P in the PF sounds for PaO2, and the F stands for a fraction of inspired oxygen. And this will be found on your ABG. The diagnostic criteria says less than 200, but anything less than 100 um, should definitely flag you as being very severe and calling ICU staff because these people are gonna crash if we don't get management started right away. What are some of the insults or causes? Again, you can go back to the MAID uh, mnemonic we talked about earlier or the four eyes. Some of the most common causes of ARDS is infection and pneumonia being high on that. In the age of COVID, unfortunately, many of the cases around the world that have needed ICU and have passed away have been from a viral COVID pneumonia progressing to ARDS. So in, in our uh, day, in today's um, pandemic world, certainly this should be high on your differential. Other causes of uh, insults leading to ARDS is aspiration, trauma, sepsis, or shock from any cause, pancreatitis, and less commonly drowning. Treatment is supportive with mechanical ventilation, and we'll go into details uh, soon. Here's a picture of lungs with ARDS. As you can see, there's hardly any black that's coming out, which shows there's hardly any lungs that are uh, involved in aeration. There is a complete whiteout, which represents the, the edema that's taken over the lungs. Before we go into management, I want to do a quick refresher on vents or ventilators. There are three modes uh, for ventilators. Oh, sorry, I see a question coming, so I'll pause to take it. Could you again, oh, the question was, I like the MAID acronym. Could you again please go over what they stand for? Absolutely. So M is malignancy and metabolic causes. A is autoimmune. I is infection, ischemia, inflammation, iatrogenic, and D is drugs. Uh, another question was the difference radiographically between CHF fat winging versus ARDS. So radiographically, it will look the same. Pulmonary edema um, is as a symptom, it's not a cause typically. So it will look the same on chest x-ray. So if you notice, if you remember the heart failure chest x-ray and the ARDS chest x-ray, they look almost identical and that's and that was intentional. We did that um, so um, you'll be able to recognize it if you see it quickly on the wards uh, or in the emergency department. The differentiation between heart failure and ARDS really comes from clinical clues. So if a patient has history of CHF or lots of cardiac causes and uh, they have other findings of heart failure, such as their BNP is up, uh, they're on um, uh, medications, they're an there is an obvious insult, uh, then you're thinking more heart failure. For ARDS, it's uh, fitting into that Berlin criteria. So they, they don't have heart failure going on as a cause of their pulmonary edema. Um, there is another insult, maybe there's, they're in sepsis or shock, maybe they had pneumonia or pancreatitis, um, this was a very acute onset, and their PF ratio uh, looks terrible. So moving on to vents, a ventilator, it has three modes to it, pressure, uh, pressure control, volume control, and pressure support. Pressure control favors control of oxygenation, and volume control favors control of ventilation. Uh, pressure support is a spontaneous mode of ventilation. This is where the patient inhales every breath and the ventilator delivers support with a preset pressure value. Uh, the patient is also able to regulate his or her respiratory rate and tidal volume. There are also other settings on the ventilator that you can control. Resp rate, IE ratios, inspiration, expiration ratios, peak plateau and peak pressures. But do you need to know all of that? I would say no. I think the most important aspects of vent management are the following. Knowing pressure versus volume, uh, knowing how to control PEEP and the FiO2. PEEP stands for positive end expiratory pressure. 
And this leads to recruitment of lungs. Essentially, you're grabbing all the alveoli who are working in gas exchange and getting them um, and, and just trying to support them to, to get help with oxygenation. However, uh, every, there's a limit to every good thing, and there could be too much of a good thing. Um, too much PEEP can actually lead to hemodynamic instability and bare trauma. Similarly, with FiO2 and higher pressures and volumes, they all improve oxygenation and ventilation to a limit, but after that, there is a significant increase of bare trauma and hemodynamic issues. If you feel like you're at that point where you have to make a judgment call of, am I reaching the threshold? I would say it would be the time to get our um, intensivist staff on call involved, um, RT uh, or any internal medicine um, senior who may be uh, nearby as well, because these are, um, these are not everyday bread and butter things that we do. And I routinely ask for help when I'm coming to this, um, to this kind of a decision-making uh, point. Sorry, next slide. Uh, so returning to ARDS management, the, the goal of ARDS management is protecting lung ventilation. That is by uh, keeping the tidal volumes low, so no more than six cc's per kg, allowing some permissive hypercapnia, so targeting a pH of 7.3 to 7.4, what this does is it allows some CO2 retention, which dry, which helps with the respiratory drive, um, as well as a high PEEP. Uh, and there is a PEEP and an FiO2 table that's available um, uh, with any critical care units, and you just um, you just sort of match up where you want to go on that. Um, you can consider proning if the PF ratio is less than 150. And lastly, if all else fails, um, there is the option of ECMO, which is a salvage therapy. Uh, it's interesting, the evidence shows that it's transferred to a specialized center that really helps with the survival benefit rather than the ECMO itself. Um, measures that have reduced mortality are high PEEP and proning. Next, we'll talk about about what do you do if you're if there's deterioration on the ventilator first just breathe you're doing everything right and these are these are very very advanced and difficult cases to manage next do what you would do anyways for any patient who's deteriorating a stat chest x-ray an abg or a bbg if you don't have an abg make sure that everything is connected sometimes things become loose and um, it could just be a matter of making sure that all the tubes are where they're supposed to be. Another option is to disconnect the vent and bag mask the patient um, until you can stabilize them. And then think of your reasons. Why did they deteriorate? So thinking of pneumonia or VAP. VAP is ventilator associated pneumonia. Maybe they have a mucus plug. Uh, a pneumothorax, any bronchospasm or anaphylaxis? Um, did they develop something completely different like a PE or pulmonary edema for another cause? I'll take a pause to take a question at this point. Are we still doing BMV in the era of COVID? Uh, can you define what BMV is? Uh, I'll wait for, oh, sorry, bag mask vent. Okay, awesome. That's a great question. And I think it's um, going to be very site dependent. Um, uh, and I'm going to touch on that in the COVID part, if that's OK. And the next question is, can you comment on interpreting VBGs in place of ABGs in the setting of hypoxemia and hypercarbia? That's an excellent question and a very common uh, scenario to encounter. So hypoxemia, you can't read from a VBG because it's a venous blood gas. So it will the PaO2 of a VBG will be low. So if you have a VBG and you're trying to figure out, is my patient hypoxemic? I would say, look at their oxygen saturation. Are they maintaining stats above 90% on their own without any oxygen? Or are they needing oxygenation? Even one or two liters means that they're hypoxemic um, and uh, you need to go down that pathway. Hypercarbia, um, you can read on VBG, but with a grain of salt. VBG has a higher 
um, concentration of CO2 just by the nature of it being a venous gas. So just keep in mind that the CO2 level you see on VVG could be artificially higher. Um, but again, in a bind, uh, VBGs are definitely faster to get. So if you have that, it will still give you uh, a ballpark measure of where your uh, CO2 is. Uh, I will cover COVID questions and topics in the COVID primer. It's coming up very shortly. So next one. Um, we'll chat about pressors next. So vasopressors are used for hemodynamic support. Uh, there are many options, norepinephrine or more colloquially or trade name, it's known as levofed, epinephrine, vasopressin, phenylephrine. Um, if you're suspecting sepsis, uh, you can go to norepi. It's, uh, and in a crash situation, you can certainly consider phenylephrine because it can be given through the peripheral IV. It's a great medication to use uh, if you don't have access to a central line, if you're not in an ICU setting, but they need something quickly. So when do we give pressors? Um, typically, they're given in an ICU setting or a monitored setting when a patient is in shock. There are four types of shock, cardiogenic, distributive, obstructive, and hypovolemic. Cardiogenic shock essentially means there's something wrong with the heart for whatever reason. Maybe it was a coronary insult, like an ACS or an MI event. Maybe it's an arrhythmogenic event or an acute valve pathology. But for whatever reason, the heart is not pumping blood forward, and that's leading to organ hypoperfusion. Distributive shock is septic shock or anaphylactic shock. This is where all the capillaries in, um, uh, in their entire body is at full dilation instead of shunting to the uh, vital organs, and that leads to an overall drop in blood pressure. Uh, it can also be seen in neurogenic shock when there's trauma to the spinal cord or uh, an injury for any reason. Obstructive shock happens in cases of pulmonary embolus, tension pneumothorax, cardiac tamponade, and hypovolemic shock happens if there's just not enough blood in the body for any reason. Maybe there's a trauma or a GI bleed, or there's cases of severe volume depletion, such as uh, DKA, HHS, or uh, dehydration from another cause. Uh, many of us may have learned about SIRS in medical school or back in the day, but now there's a new criteria for defining shock. It's the QSOFA criteria. QSOFA stands for Quick Sequential Organ Failure Assessment, and you need two of three to qualify. Either decreased LOC, as defined by GCS less than 13, respiratory rate more than 22, or a PF ratio less than 300, and hypotension, as described by systolic blood pressure less than 100. Shock is, just means that there is not enough oxygen reaching our vital organs, leading to a uh, circulatory collapse and a dysregulated host response. So clues for shock and uh, to determine if a patient is in septic shock, we'll be doing a very thorough history. Um, and what I typically do so I don't miss anything is I just go head to toe. So looking at the head and CNS, looking for signs or symptoms of meningitis, encephalitis, in the head and neck region, looking for any otitis media or externa, tonsillitis, abscesses or cellulitis. Moving down to the lungs, any signs of pneumonia, empyema, abscess, TB. Uh, in the world of COVID, any signs of COVID uh, exposure and infection. Moving down to the abdomen and the GI tract, um, looking for any sources in the liver, such as abscess, um, any GI tract, viral or bacterial infection, any SBP or peritonitis. In the GU tract, in the lower, uh, looking for any UTIs or cystitis, and then moving up to the upper urinary tract, and tract, looking for any pyelonephritis, renal abscess, and so forth. Don't forget about STIs um, and always screen for HIV, so chlamydia, gonorrhea, uh, syphilis, HIV, herpes, and then our largest organ of the body, the skin, any skin or soft tissue damage or infection, any bone or joint infection, osteomyelitis, uh, septic arthritis. Your investigations will be very broad, so firstly, establishing diagnosis. So where is the source of infection? And this is where I would recommend you to go very broad in your culture. Blood cultures times two, 
viral swab for COVID respiratory panel, and then as clinically indicated, if they're showing signs or symptoms of meningitis or encephalitis, then an LP. If they have ascites, then maybe a paracentesis for SVP. If they have a red hot joint, then an arthrocentesis, ruling out septic arthritis, and so forth. A chest x-ray would be a good first step for anyone, especially in the age of COVID, um, because viral pneumonias uh, could certainly um, be seen on that. And then the rest of your investigations will be to look for end organ damage. So the liver enzymes uh, will show any end organ damage to the liver and any loss of liver function. Uh, electrolytes, renal function is paramount as well. Um, any imaging as clinically indicated, but chest x-ray is a good place to start. Management of shock uh, or in septic shock, uh, it's gonna be the exact same approach as all our other acute cases. Just three things. Step one, stabilize and treat the acute insult. Step two, find the cause and treat that. Step three, monitor for clinical progress. So step one, acute treatment is fluids and antibiotics. Uh, the evidence shows that early fluid resuscitation and early antibiotics are life-saving. What's a good place to start? Um, you, can st you can either do a bolus of one to two liters of crystalloid solution at, off the bat, or you can um, try to calculate and give them 30 uh, cc's per kg in the first three hours. Uh, early empiric antibiotic coverage is absolutely key, but do try to uh, get the cultures first. That being said, I've had numerous cases where a patient received antibiotics before their cultures were drawn, but their cultures still came back positive, and it was still helpful for us to narrow their antibiotic choice and to figure out where their source of infection was. So in an imperfect world, we just, we just ask for what we can, and it's still okay even if you have given them antibiotics to get cultures. Uh, if you find that they're requiring pressors to, to maintain their blood pressure, then your MAP target is more than is 65 or more. Um, so that is step one, acute management and stabilization. Step two are all the investigations we talked about earlier, getting the cultures and trying to figure out the source of your infection. And step three is, manage, is monitoring, and that will be looking, at, looking for end organ markers. Um, I would do this daily until they're stabilized and we have a better idea of what's happening, where their source of infection is, and so forth. Um, something I forgot to mention is when you're doing your history uh, and assess initial assessment going head to toe, don't forget about lines and devices. Line infections are common and device infections can be critical and life-threatening. Examples of device are ICD um, or any spinal devices that patients may have. Okay, so we are going to move on to um, what, uh, and probably our greatest hit coming up, the COVID-19. So this slide is not meant to be scary. It is just there as a reference, if you'd like to pull it up later. Sorry, and Nadia, there, there was a question from Jeff um, about fluid resuscitation. Yes. She's asking if it's based on ideal body weight or actual body weight. If you could just comment on that, please. Oh, great question. Um, I would do ideal body weight. And honestly, I, to be uh, completely honest, I don't use the calculation. I just go with gestalt. If a patient's crashing in front of me, I give them a liter bolus uh, and do it as fast as possible. So pressure bagging. Uh, examples of a crashing patient will be a blood pressure uh, less than 90 systolic and really, really scary will be a blood pressure less than 70. If you have a blood, systolic blood pressure that's less than 80 or 70, then throw um, one to two liters of IV crystalloid solutions at them. That's normal saline or Ringer's lactate and um, make sure they have enough lines. So at least two large IV bore lines. This is where I would be calling the nurses and uh, asking for support because they are probably heading to the ICU and they need pressors. So if possible, trying to uh, get a central line in, maybe, per, maybe in the groin, so it's, um, it's an easier line to get in. Uh, filling up the phenylephrine syringe uh, in case they, they need that. But uh, in a patient who is crashing in from shock, don't be shy to give fluids. Um, 
just be careful though if they do have a heart failure history because that's when it gets really tricky that's when you do have to be more judicious and that's when um, they probably need icu support to help manage their the delicate balance of heart failure and fluid requirements that's a great question and i apologize for not seeing that so moving on to covid um, this is just a one pager. Uh, this is from Dr. Nick Mark. It's been circulating on the internet. It looks very legit. Uh, this is as up to date as possible, but we know that as more information comes out, this can change. So I will go into um, what we need to focus on for COVID-19, starting with the clinical clues. So the symptoms that have been reported uh, by mostly the reports from China and Italy are the following. Patients presenting with very nonspecific symptoms, cough, fever, dyspnea, or any upper respiratory tract infectious symptoms, or sometimes GI symptoms. They may also have arthralgias, myalgias, or just fatigue. The COVID-19 uh, virus has an incubation period of 4 to 14 days, but we know that it can be longer, and viral shedding um, has been anecdotally reported to be as long as 37 days. Uh, in the, the global ICU requirement uh, rate so far has been 5%. However, in Italy, it's been as high as 12%, but in South Korea, it's been as low as 0.9%, so quite variant. The fatality rate is 2 to 4%, and there's a star because unfortunately, I think it was higher in Italy. Um, and I think in North America, it's hovering around 1% right now. Some clues on investigation on your lab work uh, is CBC, you will see leukopenia or decreased uh, white blood cells, specifically decreased lymphocytes. Uh, there will be derangements uh, in the renal and uh, liver function as evidenced by increasing BUN and creatinine. Uh, from the liver enzymes, you may see an increase as well. So increased AST, ALT, total bilirubin, increased coagulopathy such as D-dimer, and increased ferritin as well. Uh, imaging has been very helpful in the global diagnosis and uh, even anecdotally in the national cases that were first uh, being picked up and hospitalized. So chest x-ray uh, will may present as hazy, uh, showing bilateral peripheral opacities. And I think the peripheral opacities is really key. The cases that I've seen um, in, um, in my site have uh, first presented with bilateral peripheral opacities uh, on their imaging. CT chest will show ground glass opacities, um, crazy paving, and consolidation. What is crazy paving? It is, um, it's basically lungs that look really scary, just like the picture here but the actual definition is scattered or diffuse ground glass attenuation with superimposed intralobular uh, lobular septal thickening and intralobular lines. If you have access to POCUS or point of care ultrasound, you will notice numerous B lines, maybe pleural line thickening and consolidations. Who are the people at risk? Not surprisingly, people, um, older people and those with comorbidities. So the um, factors of patients who have required ICU uh, globally so far has been older age, uh, median 60, comorbid conditions of diabetes, and cardiac disease. The median number of days between symptom onset and ICU requirements so far has been reported to be 8 to 10 days, um, displaying a quick deterioration, unfortunately. Predictors of poor clinical outcome are similar, age, comorbidities, as well as their admission QSOFA score, uh, which included GCS, the respiratory rate, PF ratio, and blood pressure. And the following lab findings, increased D-dimer, increased ferritin, increased troponin. What I think that lab these lab findings are implying is that there is an insult that's beyond the initial lesion. What I mean is the initial lesion may be a viral pneumonia or infection, but now it's disseminated and it's led to um, end organ damage that, such that you have increased coagulopathy, increased ferritin, and even increased troponin. I see the chat blinking, so I'll pause here to take a question. Um, sorry, I'm just going to read it. Um, 
how quickly are you seeing these chest x-ray findings? It seems obvious when we see these films, but if they don't have those findings, is there a chance they could progress quickly to the state? Uh, yes, I think that's an excellent question. Uh, and I think I would say the take home message for COVID is to have a low threshold for investigations and low threshold of suspicion. If you if you're at all thinking about COVID when you see a patient, I would order the chest x-ray right away. I would order a portable chest x-ray so there is limited exposure and transfer of that patient in the site and we can get those films quickly. Um, I think in this day and age, um, hopefully you won't get much pushback on ordering stat chest x-rays for a suspected COVID patient. I agree, I think the chest x-rays and CT scans are very helpful and getting the films would be uh, critical in making their diagnoses. Uh, I, I will pause to take another question because I anticipate it's about COVID. Uh, what, what do we do if it's a COPD patient who might have uh, COVID? Um, that's a great question. Oh, this is, a, this is an excellent question. You uh, skipped ahead because uh, my next slide deals with it. Um, I would so the WHO and CDC said no systemic steroids for COVID unless they have a compelling indication for steroids. So, and they specifically said COPD exacerbation. So I think if they have severe acute COPD exacerbation where their oxygen requirements are, are quite severe, then, uh, see, then uh, systemic steroids might be a good idea with, with that uh, reason in mind. The treatment for COVID is so uh, evolving. There is no clear cut data at all. Um, and I'm just gonna go to that slide next. Uh, I'm also gonna read another uh, information from Stay. Evidence from Italy and America saying that chest X-rays are re evolving rapidly in COVID-19 positive patients. So if the patient deteriorates clinically quickly, don't hesitate to re-image. Yes, exactly. Thank you so much for that. I think the, the take home message is um, low threshold to test and to order investigations and to think of COVID. Uh, next, oh, sorry, I'm just going to the next slide. Um, so the workup for COVID, um, like we've talked about, is a thorough septic uh, workup, <coughs> an NP swab, so a COVID specific swab, but also checking for other respiratory panel. The flu is very much um, still a player and it's still technically flu season. Blood cultures times two, urine analysis and culture, CBC, a complete a metabolic panel, liver function, renal function, and then the markers of end organ damage, such as troponin, CK, ferritin, CRP, ESR, uh, D-dimer, and a portable chest X-ray and ECG should be part of your first initial workup. And then if you're thinking uh, uh, of COVID for the patient, I um, definitely use PPE for yourself, but also make sure the patient is immediately put in a separate room and they have a mask on and also let your IPC know so they can arrange for further um, uh, management uh, requirements. So this is the slide that I think uh, probably everyone's been waiting for. And again, I, I know it's busy, but it's just meant to be a reference. The treatment for COVID is truly supportive management, like you would for any other viral infection like the flu. But of course, keeping in mind that patients with COVID can deteriorate very quickly and there could be superimposed bacterial infection or end organ damage. Def, um, so for COVID, the emerging evidence is avoid BiPAP unless there's a compelling indication, but even then, I personally would be extremely scared to use BiPAP in these patients and would not do that. If BiPAP was needed, I would move on to ventilation and another, and another way of um, uh, helping them. BiPAP increases risk of aerosolizing the virus. If they have ARDS, then it's just um, the same ARDS treatment that you would do for any patient. So ICU care and mechanical ventilation. What are the treatment options? Unfortunately, there's no clear cut data. Uh, it's really emerging. We are using the following agents based on ends of one and two uh, around the country. So what I would say is consult ID. ID has to be at the forefront uh, of your team that's taking care of COVID patients. So some therapies that are currently trialed are Tamiflu or Saltamivir, hydroxychloroquine, Curelta, which is a combo drug of lopinavir and ritonavir, and tocilizumab, which is a biologic. 
uh, at the bottom of the screen, you you will see that I have WHO and CDC says no glucocorticoids unless there are other indications such as COPD exacerbation. Um, the reason I left the mechanism of action is only for reference if you are wondering why are these meds used, because chloroquine, as we know, is an antibiotic. Um, tocilizumab is a biologic, but these are these are the reasons why they're being trialed. I'll pause here to take uh, a question. I see the chat blinking. Um, so, oh, there's a oh, there's a few questions. So I'm just going to try to catch up. One sec, guys. Um, um, in terms of PPE, are you currently approaching anyone presenting with RASP symptoms as though they may have COVID? Oh, that's a great question, and I have um, information on errors and procedures. So personally, I would I would approach any patient with respiratory symptom, regardless of travel or exposure history, as COVID. So I would certainly don a gown, uh, a mask, and a face shield, and of course gloves when seeing those patients. Um, specifically for N95, uh, in our site, that is to be kept only for aerosol generating procedures, which are intubation and related procedures. So manual ventilation, open endotrach suctioning, extubation, um, CPR, uh, BiPAP is considered an aerosol generating procedure, so to use N95 for that. Uh, any humidified high flow oxygen systems, tracheostomy care, bronchoscopy, sputum induction, any NEB ther therapy or aerosolized medication administration, open respiratory or airway suctioning, and high frequency uh, oscillatory ventilation. I hope that answers your question. I would, I would be safe and sorry and definitely use PPE for any patient that I see in the hospital. And the next question was, should we ideally be transporting patients to ICU prior to intubation? That's a great question and a tough one to answer. It really depends on their clinical status. If they're actively coding and you have to intubate, then, then you have to intubate wherever you are. Um, just be safe, make sure you have the PPE and N95 in place for intubation. But if you're able to move them to ICU, ICU is always the best place for any procedures like intubation, lines, and so forth. Next question is, if a patient code status is do not intubate, do you palliate or give BiPAP? Wow, another great question. These are very thoughtful questions, you guys. Um, so I, I, this, would be a, this would be a question with the patient. I would go over the risk of BiPAP and say this could aerosolize the virus and um, put anyone in the room at risk. So, uh, I, so that I, when I'm talking to them about goals of care, I would say I would not recommend BiPAP unless it's purely for comfort, in which case we are now palliating. Um, so I think just a frank conversation with them about code status and goals of care, and um, hopefully with their family in the room as well, so everyone's aware. Uh, the next question is, for empiric antibiotics, would you choose azithro as first choice? That's a great question. I have seen azithro flying around. Um, uh, in the news. I picked these four because they were on up to date and part of many of the site specific recommendations I've seen uh, throwing around, uh, including the Mass General or Harvard recommendations. Some people are using azithro. I think it just depends on the clinical context. Can you? Co oh, yes, I'm going to talk about ACE inhibitors and ARBs in a second. Um, are the older gener patients you've seen mounting a fever? That's a Good question. I, you know, I honestly don't know. I didn't pay attention to that, but I can find out for you. I'll, I'll send out an informal pool to my friends who have uh, managed patients uh, who are older with COVID and see what they say. But I think even if they don't have a fever and you're suspecting COVID, I would, I would treat them as such. Uh, do you anticipate hydroxychloroquine being used due to recent reports? Uh, despite there not being solid evidence, just simply, yeah, that's a great question. It looks like hydroxychloroquine is being used uh, a lot, certainly um, internationally in Italy, in China, uh, and in some other sites around the country that I know informally. Um, I'm going to go over the risks and benefit of each medication in the next slide. And uh, the next question is a very practical one, and I love that you asked this. Any tips on how to avoid exposure with PPE when using a stethoscope? No, you're just 
unfortunately, you'll just have to use it and then cavi wipe it really well um, before you leave the room. I double cavi wipe my stethoscope. I, I clean them in the room and then I go out and I clean them again and um, just, just doing your best. Are COVID patients going to ICU tend to develop ARDS? I think it depends why they're going to ICU. I suspect many of the patients going to ICU may have already developed ARDS or are heading in that way, but it um, just depends really. Okay, sorry, I'm going to continue on with the next couple of slides. Um, sorry. So this is just um, uh, a reference slide for you again, but what I want to talk about are the risks of using these medications. So Keralta um, has many drug interactions, specifically for patients on sedatives like benzodiazepines, narcotics, propofol, and, and Seroquel. Um, you may have to adjust the dose of the antidepressants if you add on Keralta. There are other uh, medication interactions as well for Keralta, specifically warfarin, doax, and amiodarone. It may decrease the, sorry, it may increase the efficacy of DOAC, so there could be an increased risk of bleeding. So for patients already on DOAC, consider using one of the other agents instead. It can also interfere with warfarin um, efficacy, so you'll have to watch their INR closely and adjust dose of warfarin to make sure they're in the therapeutic range. Um, similarly with amiodarone, it can uh, interfere with the metabolism, so consider talking to a pharmacy and seeing if there's a different medication that you can use instead. Hydroxychloroquine is a medication that has many drug interactions. So it's, it's not one that we can use um, with our eyes closed. Uh, if a patient's on hydroxychloroquine, you will have to do very close monitoring of their liver enzymes and CDC. Hydroxychloroquine can unmask G6PD deficiency, so you'll have to do daily CBCs to watch for that, but also for other, um, for any other hemolysis. Um, hydroxychloroquine is QTC prolonging, so in this case, I would caution you from using other QTC prolonging meds. So the question of azithromycin is important here. If you're using hydroxy and azithromycin, mycin, there's a risk that their QTC could be prolonged and uh, they could be at risk for arrhythmias. So I would put them on cardiac monitoring and um, watch their QT closely. Um, uh, hydroxychloroquine also has a risk of hypoglycemia if patients are on diabetic medications, SSRIs, quinolones, or salicylates. So you'll have to watch their sugars closely as well. And it can also reduce um, the efficacy of beta blockers. Um, okay, the next slide. So Bilal, if there's any uh, pertinent questions to the slides, please interrupt me. I'll just keep going with the slides now. So the next one, so this slide talks about your question with ACE inhibitors and ARBs and NSAIDs, which was a very important question. So the consensus from the Canadian Cardiovascular Society and the Canadian Heart Failure Society was any patient who are already on ACE inhibitors, ARBs, RNAs, and low-dose aspirin for cardiac causes should continue them unless there is a compelling reason to stop or hold. And the compelling reasons would be they have symptomatic hypotension or shock, they are going into acute kidney injury or hyperkalemia, in which case you would stop these medications for any patient. But they, um, the two groups have found that they don't increase your risk of COVID. So um, for now, it's just business as usual. Uh, similarly with NSAIDs, they, they haven't found overwhelming evidence of NSAIDs risk, increasing risk of COVID. Um, but that being said, NSAIDs have a lot of side effects and risks to begin with, and I generally avoid NSAIDs if I can, uh, especially in patients with cardiac history of heart failure, hypertension. So I would caution use of NSAIDs for those reasons, but, for the, but the jury's still out on COVID. So that ends the primer on COVID-19. I know you may have many questions and uh, some of the answers we may not have yet, but I, I implore you to maybe email questions to us and we can try our best to find answers for you or, or direct you to, to sources that could help. Uh, switching gears, we're gonna end off with uh, a refresher on delirium and then electrolyte management. Acute delirium can be thought of as acute brain failure. Um, 
the clinical cues are inattention, acute onset or fluctuating course, disorganized thinking, or an altered LOC. The diagnostic criteria for acute delirium is you must have inattention and acute onset and either of disorganized thinking or altered LOC. Your approach to uh, delirium is uh, good old fashioned DIMS. Uh, so DIMS stands for drugs, infection or infarction, metabolic causes and structural causes. Some of the um, uh, repeating offenders for drugs are alcohol, whether tox intoxicated or withdrawal, opioids, gabapentin, benzo steroids, or any toxidromes. For infection, any infection theoretically can lead to delirium, but in the elderly, typically uh, UTIs and GU infections are more common. And also keep in mind, any CNS infection can cause delirium in a patient of any age. Uh, something that might not come to mind um, quickly, but cardiac causes can uh, lead to delirium as well. In acute ACS, the patient has such an insult to their heart and um, in a, are in a state of a, a relative hypoperfusion that they may become agitated and their GCS may drop, uh, look, and in which case um, a cardiac workup would be absolutely critical. Metabolic causes of delirium are mostly electrolyte derangement, so hypo or hypernatremia, hypocalcemia, hypoglycemia, CO2 retention, hepatic or renal encephalopathy, hypothyroids or adrenal insufficiency. A clinical clue for CO2 retention, hepatic and renal encephalopathy are asterixis. Some structural causes are anything that's any lesion in the brain, whether it's a stroke, a TIA, a seizure, or traumatic brain injury, but also um, constipation and urinary retention, especially in the elderly, can lead to delirium and fluctuating levels of consciousness. The workup for delirium is a complete DIMS workup. Um, patients who are delirious might not be able to give the best history. So we have to, we just have to cover all the bases. So I would just, um, so starting with D for DIMS, looking at their prescribed medications, looking for any, um, any agents that could be mood altering or that could have potentially accumulated in a state of renal failure or hepatic failure and uh, tapering them or holding uh, those meds. Moving on to I, a complete uh, pan culture in the age of COVID, certainly adding a COVID swab and making sure we are isolated, and, sorry, making sure we are protected with uh, appropriate PPE, um, not forgetting about ACS and um, uh, counter and uh, maybe not intuitive causes of delirium, so doing ECG and troponin as a baseline. Uh, for M, doing a complete metabolic panel, so the electrolytes, extended lights, renal function tests, liver enzymes and function, as well as coagulopathy, and um, a blood gas to look for CO2 retention. And moving on to S, if they have had any uh, compelling history or um, signs or symptoms of an injury to the CNS, then a CT head. Um, but any patient who are elderly, if, they're, if they had a fall or if they're on anticoagulation, if there's a history of malignancy or a prior CNS lesion, I would do a CT head to see if there's any changes or if there's a bleed or something really sinister going on. Um, a tox screen and CO score only if clinically relevant. If there's a suggestion of alcohol or substance use, then certainly tox screen and blood gas would be helpful. The management is really depending on the cause, so um, treating the underlying precipitant and then adjusting your medications um, as well. Uh, in the elderly, don't forget the non-pharmacologic measures, which will help them um, become more oriented. So making sure they have their hearing aids and glasses at bedside, they have um, any family pictures or personal items near them so they feel more at home. Uh, orienting tasks, so writing their name, the name of the doctor, the nurse, taking care of them on the whiteboard, the date, the site that they're in, and maybe the reason why they were admitted can also help them stay, um, stay oriented appropriately. Um, for any questions, Bilal, I'll ask you to just interrupt me if um, any burning questions come up in the chat. Um, now on our final topic of electrolyte uh, management, we're going to focus on hyperkalemia and hyponatremia as, as they tend to be um, some of the greatest hits and uh, the more common findings of electrolyte derangement. Starting with hyperkalemia, 
Hyperkalemia is defined as serum potassium more than 5.5. Normal serum potassium levels are 3.5 to 5.5. Uh, symptoms of hyperkalemia are muscle weakness or paralysis, palpitations or paresthesias, as well as ECG changes. Some mild ECG changes when the serum potassium levels are, um, are mildly elevated are tall peak T waves. And on the extreme end, uh, it would be appearance of a sine wave, loss of QRS, loss of P wave, and progression of torsades um, D points. I see a lot of chat questions, so I will pause briefly to see if there's any burning question. Um, Nizia, just uh, I'll just let you finish because okay. we'll be done probably in the next 10 minutes and then you can take all the questions. I have them oh, all listed on. Perfect. Yeah, that sounds good. Thank you for that. Yeah, no um, uh, so for hyperkalemia, the causes, you can break them down into medication and non-medication related. So some common meds um, that can lead to hyperkalemia are ACE inhibitors, ARB, antibiotics such as septra, heparin, beta blockers, digoxin, and non-medication related the most common cause is uh, dehydration or acute kidney injury, uh, metabolic acidosis and uh, metabolic acidosis states such as DKA or HHS. Uh, don't forget rhabdomyolysis can present with uh, hyperkalemia and a clinical clue would be a patient who has recently run a marathon or has been exercising a lot or maybe they were they had an overdose and were um, unconscious for a long time, leading to muscle breakdown of their legs or arms. And then in patients with malignancy, risk of tumor lysis syndrome. The clinical clues there are they would have concurrent hypocalcemia, hyperphosphatemia, and hyperuricemia in addition to hyperkalemia. Sorry, I'm just going to the next slide. It seems to have frozen. No. Okay, sorry, there we go. Um, the approach to treatment, I break it down into how bad is the hyperkalemia. If, it's, if the serum potassium is less than six, there's no symptoms or ECG changes, then um, you can stop, take a deep breath, and you may not have to act right away. So the first question to ask is, is there any ongoing insult happening? So are they in active tumor lysis? Are they in active DKA or HHS or severe renal failure? Are they on the medications that could be the culprit? And if, that's, if you said yes to any of that, it would be stopping the culprit meds, intervening the underlying precipitant. And if there's an ongoing insult, I would move over to active management. But if you said no to any of that, then you can take a deep breath and just monitor closely every four to six hours to see um, where are they at. Many times by just treating a, a state of acute dehydration or renal failure, the hyperkalemia will naturally get better without you having to specifically intervene. Now, on the other hand, if their potassium is more than six, they have ECG changes, they're symptomatic, um, for those patients, I wouldn't hesitate. I would start treatment right away, and, street, and treatment is twofold. Uh, firstly, it's stabilizing the cardiac membrane, and secondly, it's, um, it's um, targeting the actual potassium itself and um, getting that out either via shifting or through or secretion. Some options for treatment are um, so step one, if you're going to start treatment, is always cardiac membrane stabilization, and that's through IV calcium gluconate, one gram times one. And then your options are either shifting or secretion. You can shift with insulin and Ventolin. Um, um, if you're using insulin, do keep in mind, though, that you have to use dextrose first so they don't become hypoglycemic. And to please check their uh, point of care sugars at 15, 30, and 60. Uh, minutes. Uh, for secretion options, there are, there are a few uh, um, options there, lactulose, rhizonium, KXLate, or Lasix. The reason I differentiate between KXLate and rhizonium is if a patient has history of heart failure and you've given them KXLate, you can precipitate acute heart failure. So just to be, just to be mindful of that and uh, instead uh, choose rhizonium for them. <clears throat> 
And then just like any acute management, um, monitoring is paramount. So after you've intervened, watch closely, maybe put them on a cardiac monitor so you can um, look for any changes, uh, check serum electrolytes every four hours until the potassium has stabilized uh, to less than six, and then you can back off to every six to 12 hours uh, or so forth. Hyponatremia, definitely a crowd favorite, I bet. Um, hyponatremia is defined as decreased serum sodium less than 132. It, they can manifest as either asymptomatic or symptomatic, uh, ranging from mild uh, headaches, lethargy, to confusion, and evolving into decreased LOC or seizures. The workup is, um, includes sending urine studies, urine osmolality, glucose, TSH, AM cortisol, um, chest x-ray and of course serum electrolytes. Um, the, way, the, the best way to uh, divide up hyponatremia uh, in a bind is based on volume status and the urine studies. So if you're, the urine sodium is less than 20, um, they can be either hypovolemic hyponatremia or hypervolemic, and that will be determined by your volume status exam. Is their JVP elevated? Do they have bilateral leg edema? Do they have crackles on, exam, on a chest exam? Then they're likely hypervolemic. And some clues will be that they have an underlying history of CHF, cirrhosis, or nephrotic syndrome. On the other hand, if they're looking really dry, they have dry mucous membranes, their JVP is flat, their axilla is dry, they came in with a history of diarrhea or GI bleed or trauma, they're likely volume depleted. And the reason it's important to differentiate between the two is because your management will depend specifically on what the cause of the hyponatremia is. Now, the middle category is always the tough one. It's usually make hyponatremia. Um, SIADH is on everyone's uh, differential for that, but do keep in mind SIADH is a diagnosis of exclusion after you've excluded hypothyroidism and adrenal insufficiency. I'll also pause here for an important clinical pearl. Um, there is something called pseudo-hyponatremia, and it shows itself in cases of severe hypertriglyceridemia, such as hypertriglyceridemia-related pancreatitis and DKA where there is a relative um, shifting effect and it looks like there is a reduction in serum concentration of sodium, but it's actually not the case. So before you know, jumping into any of this, I would say, look at your glucose, look to see is there any reason that the patient could be uh, having hypertriglyceridemia or other hidden um, anions and then move on to that. I've had an embarrassing story where I jumped straight into this um, lovely table in management and the patient um, was actually having hypertriglyceridemia related pancreatitis and their serum sodium was just fine. It was just looking falsely low. Going into SIADH, so SIADH stands for Syndrome of Inappropriate Antidiuretic Hormone. Uh, we gotta rule out the endocrinopathies first. Um, SIADH could be caused by many things, but the most common um, and usually overlooked are drugs, lots of antidepressant and anti-epileptic meds, SSRIs, TCAs, even opioids can cause um, or, or precipitate SIADH. Being post-operative and pain can cause SIADH as well. And then some other causes would be malignancy, but especially in the lungs, uh, and any intracranial pathology can uh, precipitate SIDH. Your treatment will depend solely on the cause of the hyponatremia. So if they're hypovolemic, give them gentle fluids. If they're hypervolemic, the opposite, diuresis, restrict free water, saline lock. If they're euvolemic, then determining if do they have a state of hypothyroidism or adrenal insufficiency. If they do, treating that. If they don't, and this is SIDH, then the treatment is really a test in patients. Saline locking, restricting free water, watching, waiting, monitoring. The biggest risk of hyponatremia treatment is overcorrection. And it can, and if overcorrected, there's a risk of osmotic demyelination syndrome, which is devastating. So in order to mitigate that risk, we recommend you correct sodium very slowly and conservatively as possible. Six to eight millimoles uh, per day, no more than that. If they have severe hyponatremia, I would check their lights frequently, every two to four hours, 
but otherwise you can back off and go every four to six hours if they're mild. What do we do if they're correcting too quickly? First, if they're on fluids, I would stop any IV fluids and just stop there and then reassess after the next set of lights. Um, if at the next set of lights, they're still going up, you can consider giving free water, which is D5W, and then reassess again. Um, another option is trying Desmopressin or DDAVP. It will lock your sodium level for 12 to 24 hours, buying you time to figure out what is happening, why are they correcting fast, and uh, what else could be at play. And that brings us to the end of the webinar and Q&A. Uh, Bilal, will you please um, help moderate the Q&A session? Yep. Um, thank you so much for that great talk, Nizia. Um, I'm just going to go through the questions. I, I just have them in uh, chronological order. So the first question was um, from an anonymous user. Um, are any cases coming through with GI symptoms alone? Should we be donning PPE for GI presentations as well? Great question. Um, I don't personally know of GI symptoms, but the literature is clear. There is um, from Italy, from China, there are many cases where they're coming in with GI symptoms alone, as well as some transaminitis. So I think the take home message is if you're thinking a patient has COVID, donning and doffing, um, being very careful for yourself and protecting yourself first, and just doing a, a thorough workup. We're seeing an exponential rise in COVID, so I think this is not the time to hold back. Uh, any patient you're thinking of COVID, I would send the complete workup. And I'll go back to the COVID slide um, so everybody knows which workup I'm talking about. I would send all of that um, as well as, and of course, if they're having GI symptoms, then adding on a stool culture um, and also following and doing a stool chart and also sending C. diff as well. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, next question was, um, COVID patients going to ICU, do they tend to develop ARDS? Oh yeah, I've already answered that question. Um, okay. So it depends, yeah, so we can move on. Okay, uh, next question was, preliminary studies show that 95% of patients are receiving antibiotics and I'm very worried about antibiotic stewardship and resistance if we are empirically treating COVID. Medical legally speaking, is there ever a case for withholding antibiotics upon initial presentation with infectious respiratory symptoms? Yeah, that's a great question and I, and I share your concern as well. So what I would do is if they're coming in and they have a clear cut um, consolidation on chest x-ray or CT and you're thinking pneumonia, um, cover them with empiric antibiotics for community acquired pneumonia, pneumonia, do the COVID swab. And if they come back positive for COVID, then consider one of these agents here, hydroxychloroquine, Keralta, or Tamiflu. Um, I, I would be hesitant to give someone any of these agents on spec without a positive COVID uh, uh, test, unless they also had very compelling findings on um, imaging, such as chest x-ray. So if they had viral opacities on chest x-ray that were bilateral and looked like this, um, I would consider starting on an agent on spec. But this is, um, this, is, this is not an individual decision. This would be a shared decision between your team and infectious diseases, as well as IPC. Perfect, thank you. Uh, next question. If a delirious patient presents with an uncertain history and there is no clear cause, would this be an indication to screen for, screen for COVID as part of the workup? Yes, I would. I would hands down screen for, uh, for COVID and I would do the entire DIMS workup, um, which is on the slide. Perfect, thank you. Um, next question. I've been told that if a patient has been on IV normal saline or any fluids, you cannot trust the urine, sodium, or urine electrolytes slash osmolality. Is that your experience as well? Yes, that's a great question, and I agree. You're right. If they've been on diuretics or have received a lot of IV fluids, then their urine lights and studies will be murky, and that's where you'll have to um, look for other clinical clues. So um, volume status exam, their clinical history, did they come in with a bleed or a trauma, or are they a hype? Um, or are they a CHF patient who has um, like 20 kilos of uh, volume on board? Okay. Um, 
Next question is from Sandra. Just to clarify, if no ECG changes, but potassium is greater than six, would you still stabilize the cardiac membrane? I would, yeah, because there's a risk that it can become destabilized. Okay, just making sure there's no other follow-up questions as we go. Um, and this is the last question I have, unless somebody else uh, chimes in, but um, what are the typical IV fluid orders? you make for someone with mild slash moderate slash severe hyponatremia as a start, i.e. how many cc's of normal saline or ringers over how many hours, et cetera? Okay, okay, good question. Um, so I think first, the first uh, point of the approach would be, do they need IV fluid? So are we confident that they're coming in with hypovolemic hyponatremia? And if that's the case, I would give them gentle fluid. So you, um, something so normal saline would be the fluid of choice and i would give them maybe you can either do 125 um, milliliters per hour over two to three hours or 75 milliliters as well if you want to go slow and low or you could do a small bolus of uh, 250 to 500 mils right now and then recheck lights in um, two to four hours so it really depends on how dry you think they are and um, how much uh, fluid they need. But the key thing to do is uh, check lights often so you know what the outcome of your intervention was. If it's if you're not sure, I would check lights in three hours and see what did my intervention do? Did I go in the right direction or not? Or did I overshoot it? I hope that answers your question. I know the medical textbooks would say to calculate it out. Um, so that's always an option to do that as well. But um, I know in a bind, clinical gestalt is probably what you're getting at. All right, Monica said thank you. So I, I, I okay. think you answered it. Uh, uh, thanks. <laughs> next question from uh, Jessica here is, if someone is on chronic immune suppressants, should we rec recommend stopping them if there is a risk of COVID um, and for how long? And then follow-up question to that is similar question for inhaled corticosteroids. Oh, excellent question. Wow. I think that's like a board exam ID question. Um, and I'd love to hear what an ID specialist would say. So I'm always hesitant to stop you know, um, uh, to agents for immunosuppressed patients because they really need to tend to need it. I think if we're going, if we're asking that question, it would be a shared decision with infectious disease. Oh, and sorry, you asked about the steroids. So as um, you can see on the last line of WHO and CDC says no group of corticoids for any patients that are suspected or confirmed to have COVID unless there are compelling other indications. So unless they have concurrent COPD exacerbation and they're in severe respiratory failure, I wouldn't do uh, systemic steroids. Okay. Um, we have a question from Danielle. Uh, for COVID patients at peripheral sites, i.e. non-ICU, no IM, no anesthesia, what would be your indicators to initiate transfer to ICU capable centers? Great question. I, I would say um, any signs of deteriorating respiratory failure that is not responding to your pharmacotherapy uh, and bag mask ventilation. Um, that's one. Another one would be any uh, emerging end organ damage. So if they have, now they're suddenly complaining of chest pain or discomfort, there is ECG changes, a troponin rise, or their liver function tests start to go up, um, or they have renal failure. I think at that point, it would be a call to, um, to a site with, um, with um, more escalated support. Awesome. Um, Next question. Oh, sorry. And just to go back to that first question, yes. I will also um, um, bring your attention to this slide, factors requ requiring ICU. So if it's a COVID patient and they're older age, they're diabetic, they have cardiac disease, or they had um, a lot of lab abnormalities on admission, uh, even if they're quote unquote stable, I would still call the um, urban site to consider transfer or at least a remote follow because these are patients who are vulnerable and they could crump uh, any minute. Awesome. 
Um, we have a question from Rocky. Um, how about inhaled corticosteroid for COVID dyspnea? Okay. Um, hmm. I'm trying. So, if they have COPD or asthma exacerbation, then I would hold their inhaled uh, corticosteroid and instead uh, do the COPD exacerbation management. And I'm just going to bring you to that slide. So, uh, Ventolin and Ipratropium around the clock, and Ventolin uh, rescues every one to two hours as needed, and systemic steroids uh, instead of inhaled corticosteroids. Now, on the other hand, if um, let's say they were admitted for something else like heart failure and they're becoming dyspneic, then I would uh, reassess why are they dyspneic. So going to this bedside approach and um, trying to uh, get to the bottom of that. I hope that helps. I'm sorry if I didn't answer the question. Okay. Um, sorry, they're rolling in here. So, um, Dr. Kotrek, good cardiologist from uh, St. Catharines, has uh, a question here. What suggestion do you have if a family member is COVID positive and you are self-isolated? I mean, Justin Tudor's situation, his wife's positive, he is not. How long should somebody like him stay isolated? He tested negative, but can he be infected a few days later? Would appreciate your thoughts on this. Oh, good question. I think that's also another um, ID board exam, probably, uh, question. Um, so if a family member is, uh, sorry, I'm just going to bring us to the COVID slide. Uh, if a family member has COVID positivity for sure, then they are asked to be in quarantine in the home itself. So in a separate room of the house or a separate floor, if possible, they shouldn't be eating meals with the family, but they should be eating meals by themselves in their room. Um, people are asked, their family members are asked to bring the food and leave it outside their door. They should have copious hand sanitizers, garbage bins um, nearby. So uh, everything that they touch is being thrown into a garbage and they're washing hands constantly. Um, now, if the family member has COVID negative, um, and I think right now the recommendation is still self-isolation for 14 days, but to be honest, I can definitely say that this is uh, evolving so quickly. I would call uh, 811 or your local public health authority to ask because it, I think it's very case dependent. But the question also becomes what if you're a healthcare worker and you're COVID negative, you've gone through self isolation, but you have a family member who's COVID positive? That's a very tricky scenario. And uh, this is one I would defer to public health and uh, WHS for, for specific guidance. Okay, perfect. Um, Adrian has a question about recommendation for psych patients coming to psych emerge, i.e., CAMH, uh, with simple, simply mild URTI symptoms. Hmm, good question. Uh, I would have a low threshold, and I would screen for COVID. I would do the uh, workup. Um, so I would also send for end organ damage. Uh, get a baseline portable chest X-ray and ECG if you have that. If you don't, um, I don't know if CAMH admits or not, but would admission be something you'd consider and then try to arrange those investigations? Um, I, I, I can sense the, um, the difficulty of that situation where they may not be compliant or may not be willing to go through. But I think in this day and age, um, we should just test and screen more broadly than not. Okay. Um, I think there was a question. I think I sent this to you earlier already, Nazia, but do you have any resources for off-service re residents to be redeployed to join an IM team? Uh, quick overview, refreshers, high-level on-hand investigations, differentials, treatments, etc. cetera. Um, I think I'm going to reach out to you and Hamza offline, and when we send out the slides, we'll try to send uh, something like that along if we can. That sounds great, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Are there any other questions before we end the end the talk? Nope, doesn't look like anything else. So perfect. Thank you, Nazia, for that great talk. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining in today.
Um, feel free to visit our website, um, provide feedback to us for the speakers, provide feedback on the talk, uh, what worked, what didn't work, um, and hopefully we can do more uh, in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you, Bilal, for moderating so well. And big shout out to the MMEC team for putting this together. I don't think um, this was mentioned before, but this webinar was put together within hours just over the weekend and everyone came together from around the country the organizers are all from different provinces and sites and i think it really speaks to the cohesion of our profession and our willingness to help each other during these times you know everyone stay safe wash your hands and uh, just stay connected and we'll get through this together thank you so much <laughs>